Welcome, right. folks, to the Gritty Podcast. We're coming at you from the studio here in uh, Fruit Heights, Utah. And today we had, it was a pretty cool day. It was uh, Operation Conquer Hunger mm-hmm. down here in the parking lot. We had uh, the whole giant family of mountain ops down there. There's a lot of people. Um, uh, putting meals together for starving kids. So yep. that was pretty sweet. And also what's going on this month at uh, Mountain Ops is... Operation Conservation. Correct. We've got a lot of ops going on, a lot of operations that are in the full effect. Uh, the one that was going on today was really cool, something that Trevor and his team had planned for a long time to do. Wanted to really do it, which was 10,000 pounds of food, yep. 50 volunteers equals 17,000 mills and that were built today. Today, our other guest, we have, so we have Jordan Harbertson, Mountain Ops, and we have uh, Jared Frazier. Two yep. percent conservation. Yep, and uh, it's appropriate this month to talk about two percent for conservation, since yep. this is uh, Conservation Month here at Mountain Ops. And um, I'm always eager on Gritty to talk about conservation, uh, all types, all kinds. And um, in fact, I have a call later today with Zion. To talk about oh, yeah. the New Zealand uh, the offshore conservation Himalayan tar. Uh, coal that's planned by the yeah the uh, incredibly insane Eugene Sage. There's been a lot of weird Department of Conservation, Conservation Minister news in the last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, it's so it's a it's a strange time that we live in right uh-huh. now. My videos on YouTube get a little bit uh, shut down. Um, they don't promote them or or. Or mm-hmm. share them because there's too much. Uh, I show too much of the skinning and the packing of the meat yep. in the films, and so they get um, shut down. Yep. Uh, not suitable for most viewers, it says. And I'm like, but where all does the your ones... food come from? Yeah, where does your food come from? Like oh. that connection is important. If we're yeah. such a squeamish society that we don't want to see. The, the where protein where meat is actually harvested from that's sad that's sad and the fact that you want to just eradicate um speaking to the tar situation that's going on in New Zealand right now you want to literally just eradicate and just get rid of like i think it was nearly like 30,000 30, 30,000 tar and it's interesting because i have I, I told Brian this Brian went on his first tar hunt this year mm-hmm. i went on mine 2 years ago and I also did a stag hunt. I did like an air polish sheep and a couple other things. And I said, man, I, New Zealand is just rich with beautiful, breathtaking views, incredible culture, really cool place on earth. Mm-hmm. And then this, this animal that lives there, the tar is just the coolest thing in my mind. I love everything oh, about they're, them. They're yeah. fascinating. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're, they're bold. They're, they're tough. Um, and so I, that was my favorite part of New Zealand. I, more so than the stag or anything else was Fallow. It's hunting tar, them. Man, those, those tar, man. Those phenomenal. And they're endangered in their native, right. their, their, their home country. Yeah. And so you have this endangered species, but yet they're thriving in New Zealand. And, and you know, the idea that because, because they don't want to manage them or this, this, this Green Party gal wants to – eliminate them in New Zealand, you could end up conceivably in so in a short period of time having no tar left. Yeah. And that's kind and of disturbing. It's not the only species having that happen to it right now. Yeah. Um, right now, uh, you know, the Sheep Foundation has been, been working the, the last couple of years with the situations with, with guzzlers in the West. And some people want to have this pristine, no guzzlers out in the desert landscape because you know that's the way it was well the other way it also used to be was no condos on the water sources yeah and so a lot of the folks who want to see the guzzlers gone are living in these condos where the sheep would go get their water naturally right you get rid of the guzzler you're getting rid of the sheep yeah 
And that's, yeah. that's, that's the thing too, is that there's a lot of things that aren't the same. Right. The idea that you can just throw it back or that it's going to be okay if you just. Bison or another. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it, it, the, the, the sad oh. thing about bison is that's a, that is a lifestyle choice. Yeah. That, Amer- that American people or, or that society has made is, is like, we're not okay with thousands and thousands of bison roaming the West because they might walk across our highways and they might go through our yards and they might go through all of our, well, for some ranchers, houses. it it could wipe them out. You know, yeah. there, there are some legitimate, uh, concerns there, but it's, 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 uh, you know, humans, They'll, we're, we're, we're pretty savvy at coming up with solutions. Yeah. So, we could be, if we, if we, we could, cared, if we wanted yeah. to, yeah. if we cared and but, if we wanted to, but what it gets me is the people that faux care, the, right. the ones that are like, let's shut down all the guzzlers. Yeah. And restore it to the way it was. Yeah. They, they, that's pretending like you care, but it's not a real right. care. It's not a real solution. And then when you're like, let's let's care for the buffalo like we have the elk and restore them to native regions of the mm-hmm. United States, and they're like, yeah, no, yeah, no, let's keep them in Yellowstone. That's good, yeah. you know. Um, and to New Zealand, speaking to New Zealand, there are so many invasive species in New Zealand. Um. The, most of the ones that you will see yeah. are invasive. And so yeah. why the tar? Like, what? why are we so focused on eliminating all the tar? Why Why not the possum? Mm-hmm. Why not the wallaby? Why not the, you know, I mean, the list is... Goes on The and list on. is long. Mm-hmm. Um, the pig. Uh, why mm-hmm. not put all your effort into eradicating pigs? I think what's frustrating about this thing, especially when you look at the logic behind this, it's it's this this theory to to eliminate an animal from the landscape that is um, endangering the plant life. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of animals on the landscape endangering plant life in New Zealand, including the billions of sheep that live there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the domestic yeah. and the stag. It's like. We allow domestic animals all over the yep. landscape, and we're okay with that. Yeah. They wreak havoc on the landscape, but there that's that's an industry that's able to pay their way. Yeah, but so is hunting, and New that's Zealand's, the part folks don't get, and that's part of why we exist. I mean, New Zealand's <laughs> crazy on the on the amount yeah. of money they make from tar. Yeah. So the the idea that that there's not a giant economic value here right. is insane. It's a matter of who's going and 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 speaking with lawmakers, and us hunters are not great at that. Many, most are not. I should say there are some who are fantastic and are are standing up and carrying ninety nine percent of the weight, but it is less than one percent of the hunting population that's actually doing something. Um, and you see it happen, especially to fringe species, uh, or or where any kind of wildlife is just fringe because it's there. You, you look at the, uh, you know, the, the spaying and neutering of, of deer on, on the, on the East mm-hmm. coast, you know, um, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, people want to go, well, that's cause there's no hunters. No, there's a lot of hunters who live there. There's a, there's a million hunters on the East coast. There's a lot of folks. Um, but it, the, the wildlife are not something that uh, folks are directly connected with. Now they're wool. Yeah, they are. You know, uh, people don't want to have less access to, you know, sweet, sweet, uh, wool from New Zealand. Yeah. And, and you can talk about the families who have been here this long in this industry. There's families who have been guiding in New Zealand just as long. Well, and I was talking to Zion the other day, just a little bit exchanging some messages and he was talking, I was like, you know, tar, when we were down there, you know, tar wasn't the biggest dollar item, ticket item that a hunter could come and, and hunt. Right. right, they can do stag, and that's typically a big dollar item, yeah. or even fallow deer. But the one thing that he mentioned was you can also hunt stag all over the world. Yeah, you can do it in Scotland, you can do it in Argentina, South America, Argentina. Yeah, Argentina's huge. I mean, yeah. you can do it in many, many places in the world. You can also hunt fallow in many places in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, Australia as well. And there, there's 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 opportunity to hunt stag and fallow in many places. But where are tar? Right. Where are the Alps? Where can you hunt epic mountains, a mountain animal in mm-hmm. such an incredible, like, 
Lord of the Rings majestic location with an animal that's as phenomenal and, and mesmerizing as the tar. Where can you go in the world for that? That's New Zealand. And they, and, uh, the other thing about the tar that, um, <clears throat> you know, that uh, when I was over there that I experienced was what everything that you just described. And also like we ate our tar and they were delicious. It tasted yeah. good. Um, well, but he was describing that, you know, one of the reasons that people choose New Zealand to go for stag mm-hmm. is because they can also do tar at the same time. Yeah. You take away the tar, and they might just go to Argentina instead. Yeah. Right? They it's, might it's go a lot cheaper. to a lot of other places instead of New Zealand. But, this is, this but it's is that package. Yeah. Thing. This is what I said uh, when I was discussing this just last week with uh, an associate because we were talking about this as I started to see it coming on social media. In fact, you had posted about it, and it brought light to me because I hadn't seen it. And then I'll start... I started seeing it like everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's like the tar, what's going on here. And so I started diving into it. And economically, just like anywhere in the world, we Mm -hmm. we talk about domestically here or we talk about abroad. Um, What I always find interesting is the solutions that don't seem to be thought out or it's a very lazy idea in Mm -hmm. my mind. It's like, let's just kill them and then then we solve the problem. And it's like, no, because economically, um, I don't understand because right now, most people don't know this. So you can pay Zion. He's got an outfit. You can pay Zion. He'll put you in great opportunities to hunt these in gr- cool places. Mm-hmm. Um, you pay a fee for that. You got to you get your travel expenses. And you also have to, if you have success, you then got to pay to get that thing back. And so there's a lot of things that happen. It can be a very expensive trip. Anybody can literally get a plane ticket to New Zealand right now, fly over to New Zealand. If they talk to the locals, they can find one of the red shacks that mm-hmm. are the base of these awesome mountains. Yep. You can go hunt a tar for what it costs you just to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you get that back home and your trip is extremely affordable. And it's an incredible mm-hmm. experience, an incredible hunt that can be done if you're capable and yeah. you know yeah. the right people and you talk. And so what I, what I was telling to the gentleman, as I said, this is me as a businessman looking at this simply saying, I just don't understand how you can't just incentivize not only locals, but bro- you know, outside of New Zealand to, to help, them understand that, that this is a, an animal that you can come pursue and hunt. We, we're looking to help harvest, mm-hmm. you know, 30,000 of these. That's a lot they're, of tourism dollars. That's a lot of tourism dollars. That's a lot of, <laughs> I mean, for guide and outfitters, if they're yeah. able to, to advertise that more and help and, and maybe plus, plus, cut down their cost to, plus, to make it more incentivizing. Well, let's look yep. at the cost of eliminating 30,000 30, tar oh, from, it's, helicopter from helicopters and insane. poison. It's not, it's not cheap. Yeah. You're going to so, look at your cost and it's, it's not doing any, you're losing over here just to. Plus like, there's a simply, negative impact from the efforts of the call. That's part of what has stopped a couple different. Uh, efforts here in the West with the, you know, the feral horses mm-hmm. uh, is, is the ramifications of the, the tool use or the comb- combination of tools. So there's that immediate cost of the helicopter, the poison, the staff, the contractors, all, all of that, which is obscene. Uh, but then the long term, what you've done to the landscape with the tools mm-hmm. that you used. Uh-huh. I mean, there, there are still kids in parts of the U.S., tripping over poison bombs that were set up for coyotes Mm -hmm. 70 years ago. Yeah. You know, and, and their dogs are dying and they're in the hospital and whatnot. And, and I mean, that's, that's just on the poison side. You, you look at what you do to, you know, their concerns are supposedly for vegetation and there, there is something to be said for that because it is a very unique ecological scape. It looks like Lord of the Rings for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the, it's the vegetation there, but there, as you said before, there are much easier fish to fry. Yeah. Than the tar. Yep. Not, not, and not only that, they, less they have a, ones. they have a tar control plan that yeah. they've, that the a committee came together and put together years ago. And, and it, they, if they need to manage that better, they should work on that tar control plan. This, this minister is just ignoring all of that, everything. And, and the solutions and, too. And based on an ideology of this is an invasive species, so we need to wipe it out. Oh. Um, and I understand that. Like, I understand that invasive species. But virtually every domestic animal in our country and in theirs is domestic is is an invasive species. Yeah. Managed, fenced, whatever it is, but managed. I don't understand why you can't let this animal run free range in certain ranges where it is. It hasn't crossed into other alpine areas. Mm-hmm. Those those certain parts of the of their of their mountain ranges are have tar and the, and they're not allowed to spread anywhere mm-hmm. else, and they don't. Manage that the way you've been managing it. It makes complete sense, you know. Yeah. Um, Economically speaking, uh, New Zealand. Uh, I, I don't. 
I think there, there's been a lack of information on the New Zealand their side. Um, it's an expensive place to live mm -hmm. because they have to carry their weight in so many different ways that because of trade and whatnot, we don't experience the same thing here. And of course, limited, limited space. So the management itself, they've been outpaying uh, per citizen more than what, what most countries see. It's yep. just, it's been mismanagement so far. And so there's already negative. The cost feeling. of fuel, the cost of a vehicle, right. the cost of a place to live. We talked about it with our guides down there. It's through the roof. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Um, the one thing that this minister also said she want she, expan she plans to do is to eliminate all the trout in the country, wipe out all the trout. So they're famous for their brown trout right. and all the various trout species that, that thrive in New Zealand. So she's going to wipe out the tar and she's going to wipe out the trout. I, it just, it kind of, it's kind of, uh, first of all, it's, it's, you've, you've already let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. Good luck like, with the trout. Good luck with the trout. Like how, yeah. how do you, are you planning to poison the water supply? Like exactly how yeah. do you achieve that goal? Um, and, and in, in, and and w why, mm -hmm. like, what is the objective? Uh, since so many people love New, New Zealand's famous for fly fishing, yeah. um, fishing in general for trout. I mean, it's some of the best in the world. So it's just a, a it's a it's it's this concept of conservation and management. Yeah, you know of of are these natural because this is what they are. They're they're a natural resource. Yeah, right. You you harvest them and they. They reproduce and they harvest and they reproduce. And if they're managed well, I don't see any reason why you can't have uh, the same way you can have cattle on a piece of land. Yeah. You can have wild animals that are non-native on a piece of land as well. And as long as they make economic sense and they're a viable resource, a renewable resource, it seems foolish to... It's it's like eliminating the cattle industry because yeah. they're not native species. It's like, wait a minute. There's a lot of dollars here. There's a lot of food here on the hoof. And unfortunately, the dollar side is what we have to talk about when we when we talk when we speak with these folks or to the community. But there's a you know there's a, a debate within the conservation community regarding invasive versus uh, a landscape that has evolved. Um, right. you know, parts parts of the West do not look like they used to, but they function. Uh, we don't have keystone species, you know, the, the bison, the grizzly, they used to be all over the place. And these areas don't work the same, mm -hmm. but we're not wiping out all the pheasant because they're from China or the Hungarian partridge, mm -hmm. you know, um, all the, and there are some places where we are trying to do things, you know, different orgs are trying to do things like that, you know, bring them back. Yep, yep, but sure. you can manage and fill in gaps that there, there was opportunity. If you go in and rip out this thing that's been in there for a hundred years, mm -hmm. there, there's examples of that in Iceland, uh, in Scandinavia, Scotland, uh, different parts of the world where species were brought in, were there for a long time. The ecosystem changed. And you rip out that piece that was in there after the change, you know, that was part of the change and then part of this new uh, landscape, and you've done irreparable damage often. Uh, things, things shift and move, and in and, you know, and, and California, in the Bay Area, they're dealing with this uh, type of grass that's come in and filled all the marshes. However, it's created habitat for this endangered bird. And this exactly. Bird, <laughs> you know, like and this bird, it's the only place it can go. It's a very similar to our situation. So they're sitting there. They're trying to stop it from growing. But at the same time, if they get rid of it, this bird will probably go extinct. And, and truly, um, the the advent of the, the growth of humanity has brought on mass extinction events. Basically, in yeah. the last few hundred years, are spread across the world, up across the continent. Boundaries being, travel being as as fluid as it is from country to country. We have introduced plants and animals across the, the mm -hmm. world to make it one global world. And unfortunately, we have, we were just down here the other day and, uh, there was a giant bullfrog, uh, eastern bullfrog yeah. in the pond over here that, that Cody at Wild Arrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not Cody, uh, um, <laughs> Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He, 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 uh, he shot it with his bow. <laughs> the thing was the size of a small rabbit it was huge. On, a, on a rock. And he's like, 
I don't think I can shoot it. I'm like, well, yeah, you can. He's like, no, I think it's you can't shoot him without a permit. Or I'm like, dude, it's an invasive eastern bullfrog. <laughs> it's eating the peepers. Yeah, shoot it. I'm like, you can. <laughs> this thing is eating like I think small children. Was, <laughs> yeah, I think he was maybe worried because of the size of it. Because like, this is a big. There's game a kindergarten animal? down the road. Yeah, Get this, that thing out of here. This and, thing uh, isn't normal. That's and and it, and you know you have these species marching across into parts of the country that, that that they didn't used to live in. Yeah. And and we have caused mass extinctions because oh, yeah. the, it's the it's survival of the fittest. And it, and we want to preserve some of these animals that are a little slow to adapt or to compete with something like this giant bullfrog, right? The right. smaller western bullfrog is just dinner. Dinner. And <laughs> so yep. um in some ways I feel like we're 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 we Yes, I want to preserve species absolutely and do what we can. But also I I'm I'm re- I'm a realist and I know that some of these things we're not going to be able to stop. Yeah. Um yeah. We 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 have enough knowledge and and resources to do a lot of good. And that is the the, you know, the whole purpose behind the different argument or, or i would say the the everyone is is trying to do something right here yes that, what they think is right yes but you i know. i look at all of this and it's like if you take that tar and you put a tax on each one taken right and those mm-hmm. dollars go to help with tar management in other right? parts of the world even yes exactly yeah. not and and not just not just in New Zealand, but no. even in New Zealand, if the burden is is there, or if they're worried about its ability, let it pay for itself as a yeah. as a tool. And maybe it's a case where you're you have another animal that's in dire need yeah. of of help, but it takes a lot of dollars to get there mm-hmm. to protect it. You use the tar to yeah. save the other animal, and and yes, it's an invasive species, but it it it's pretty well easily managed it's not like like um a certain like a possum where right where it's recluse and hard to find and right and and or like pigs seem to be in unstoppable yeah you know what i mean you could pretty much conceivably kill all the tar if you wanted to you could yeah th- because they're not like trout good luck but with the tar, tar exactly there there's different yeah. species that have that ability like good luck eliminating the coyote yeah. Right, yeah. folks we, have tried. We tried. We tried, and all we did was like it's like a it's like the Hydra. Yeah. Every head you cut off, six and more they go come back. back smarter and faster. Yes. <laughs> um, and so there's, but t- but why worry so much about that tar? Because that yeah. species is one. Any day, any given time, if you wanted to, you could t- you could take them out. It'll cost yeah. a lot. But you can take them out. Good luck with trout. The the notion of of one species managing one species and using the dollars from that to pay for another that can't pay its way is something that's been very successful with the North American model and Africa and Africa and it and to varying degrees. There's always you know someone can always comment. Well, this one species. Well, yeah, we screw up sometimes, but it's been very. Yeah, <laughs> just varying levels of screwing up. Um, there's uh, there's a capacity with these ones. I mean, if you're if you're talking cull, or if you're talking, you know, in some states where they're 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 selling you know nine doe tags, mm-hmm. right? But then you have another species that's on the edge. Well, those nine doe tags are paying for that species that's on the edge, right? Um, we do have a, a glaring failure. Here in the lower 48 and and in southern BC with with the uh, caribou, yeah. um, it's a it's a species that migrates. It moves in between. So I mean, you're going to have those things that obviously we still need to get more savvy with. The low hanging fruit's been gone after, but this part of what makes us feel so wrong is this is low hanging fruit. The tar is yeah 100 percent yeah yeah. It's it's not like trying to solve the caribou where you have different tribes, agencies, nations. It, and, and it migrates in between and you have, all, you know, it's the tar and it's New Zealand. It's literally a Petri dish and you know what the bug is sitting in there. Exactly. So, yeah. And I have had a ton of people write into me, um, since they heard about this and they're like, do, does, does the minister, does she not realize that I have been saving for like five years or 10 years to go hunt tar? And I want like, to that give her all pinnacle. that money. Yeah. This is the <laughs> pinnacle experience and in adventure and hunting that I, I want to go have that like this, yeah. I'll, I'll be crushed if I can't go to New Zealand to hunt tar. 
Like yeah. that is the dream. Yep. That is one of those dream bucket list type right. adventures. Um, and I think it's only been growing uh, in the last <clears throat> five to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Now is not the time to eliminate the tar. They're just about to to be a major, major resource, now's, I feel. And now's now the is, time to use it as a catalyst. I was just going to say, now is uh, the time to definitely use it as a springboard to be able to tell the story of New Zealand and the opportunities uh, that lie there. You know, because everyone in this, what, what I found over the last two years is everyone always asks me, oh my gosh, how's your stag hunt? Right? Because that's what, for New Zealand, that's what everyone is like, these massive, you know, homegrown yeah. stags. That make weird noises. And I walk, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the make roar. The, <laughs> and the and the the, the tar we say that in elk are <laughs> yeah. elk are normal elk are normal <laughs> that's a normal sound yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's how an animal's supposed to sound that's right <laughs> but you get you once you've experienced I think that's what's hard for maybe some of some of the people that you've got like Brian you say this guy's got you know a, a dream that he's had and he's been saving up for it and. I was fortunate to be able to go. I mean, New Zealand, what was interesting for me was New Zealand was always a destination point for me too. My whole life, even before Lord of the Rings, even before any of that, that was, it was so, I was so just infatuated with this island. I wanted to go to it. I love the people's culture. I love the way they talk. I love the, the beauty of the land. Their and humor. Their humor is just <laughs> unbelievable. And when I went there, I thought I was going to be so excited about my stack, which is typically what most people are. And they're usually saving up their whole life to go hunt a stag. Mm-hmm. I mean, the cost on a stag, at least a, a non-free range stag, you can go hunt f- free range stag and on public land. And, but these other big massive stags you can hunt are not that cheap. I walked away f- and I told Brian, this is, I will go back to New Zealand every year. If I can, I just want to hunt tar mm. that experience. And so once you've had the experience, you, you've, you've had that relationship with the animal in their, you know, in their, uh, I would say in their, in their, uh, home, it's, I start to get, and I've had people ask me too, mm-hmm. why are you getting so, um, why are you standing? I mean, this isn't the United States, Jordan, like, yeah, let's focus back at home. Let's, let's take care of our issue issues and let's let New Zealand take care of And I'm like, no, see, that's just the wrong mentality. Like yeah. I, I, we, what, whatever New Zealand is going to do, it affects us. Yep. And, and it also sends messages to our own within mm-hmm. our own borders. Like I said earlier, we live in a global world. It, this now. is a global yeah. world. Yeah. This is not uh, us versus them. This is not New Zealand and well, United States. This when is when BC bans grizzly bear hunting. That affects the United it, States it of America comes, hunters. It, yeah. That yeah. affects people in New Zealand. That affects everyone around the world who maybe had aspirations or desires to go and pursue that animal in that place. And it's a cultural yeah. thing, you know. The yeah. cultural it's a cultural impact. war in a sense. Yeah. And there's a there's a battle t- and a front out there right now to to stand for hunting and what it means and what value it has and conservation let's face it like it's tied to hunting that's uh-huh. where the majority of all conservation dollars come from there are uh, some other groups that are non-hunting that contribute mm-hmm. but it pales in comparison it's, it's a little spit in the bucket uh, Jared and I were talking about this a little bit earlier and actually he it was funny as I was talking to him about it. He's like, Oh, I'm building an ad right now that basically says that. <laughs> and I, and I said to him because Sam Solholt had, had mentioned this on a podcast with, uh, Ben O'Brien when they're in his public land bus. Um, he said, Ben had asked him a question, you know, what do you, what do you think it means to be a conservationist today? And Sam kind of in a roundabout way said, you know, the, the way that we have perceived conservation for so long is, is kind of old and done. Um, mm-hmm. simply buying a, a tag and saying, I'm a conservationist is just not enough yeah. today. Yeah. Um, we need to do more. Uh, we need to be more active. We need to be more involved. We need to speak up and use our voice. Um, we need to help them participate and fund organizations. But I think like you said, like there's people that are fighting on Capitol Hill and that's less than 1% of the oh, total. It's, it's such a tiny, so it's great that we have no. that, but like, we also have millions of us no. that if we were to rally you know behind that banner of conservation and be active and be educated and be informed um when for me this started to change was um even just recently when Lan Tani from Backcountry Hunting Ang- Anglers invited me to come down to Salt Lake City to meet with Mike Lee and his staff yeah and i was like oh man like so i started i read and senator mike lee is republican in utah senator yeah uh, and, uh, for those who don't know, if you've listened to Gritty, you pretty much know, but he's kind of a public land grabber. And from what I have seen, I think the, the political term is Jack wagon, Jack wagon, <laughs> Jack um, wagon. Although I, I'm, I haven't heard from Jordan yet on the personal, uh, meeting he had 
with, oh, he's very uh, personable with uh, Mike Lee. <laughs> And um, it was uh, as Land and I went into the, the meeting and discussion. It was interesting because I also got to to watch one of the one percent of our industry or our community, yeah. Land Tony, go to work, being so extremely well versed in the issues, not only for uh, the United States but also for my state. And mm-hmm. he's from Montana, but mm-hmm. his organization represents all of us, and he's yeah. fighting for our rights to to save public lands, wildlife, and and waters. And uh, as we went into the meeting, you know, Brian, you'd brought up earlier, like. You know, this this prime minister is just over here in left field. Like, let's kill them all. Department of Conservation Minister. Yeah. Minister of the, Conservation. The, yeah. the department. And, and, and so she's just way over here, way yeah. out. Like, this is what I want to do, right? So she's taking her stance. I want to kill all the trout, making her stance. And as I watched our discussion with, as we went through kind of a, a back and forth of understanding, you know, we described who we were. Mm -hmm. Uh, we wanted to understand some of the issues. We talked about his speech. We brought up some of the points that we thought were a little misleading or that we were concerned about. And what I found from that meeting, because we weren't able to get into the meat and potatoes. So we've got some more meetings that we're setting up with them to continue the discussions with us, uh, us and them. But what I did find interesting, and there's one thing that Land said that I really appreciate is he said, listen, we obviously have deep concerns about all of this. Um, it's, it's, uh, you're saying some of the right things to us now. You're saying land transfer and you're saying we really, really want to really do this and that. And he says, yes, but then let's discuss those partials and let's do a land trans, like transaction for those. And let's not discuss turning from federal to state. We can simply address these things, which is, you know, the problem that you're saying is the, the, the community from Ogden to Provo is 80% of the population in Utah. It's kind of landlocked because of some of these public places that are not allowing them to grow outward. And so then, let's all right, address those specific let's address issues. those specific. So that's what I brought up. As I said, as, as we were getting to the discussion, I looked at uh, and I said, it sounds like to me that we should only, we should be discussing more about those parcels of land and the acquisition of them that the state needs in order to allow the communities to grow here. Yeah. Um, and then we need to not have a discussion about transferring any of these lands that are on the Wasatch Front and these beautiful wild places behind us that we know homes aren't going to be going into. And these are the lands that we want to have access to. And as we got further into discussion, the last thing that Land said that, that really hit me was he said, you know, you guys obviously understand where the side that we're on, we don't want it, but we also understand that sometimes that stance is not the stance that gets things done. So we need to continue to find those things that allows us to solutions, the solutions compromises and the compromises. And that, that's what I took away from that meeting was like, we still have so much more to discuss with them. There is a long road here in Utah that we have with Senator Mike Lee and his, you know, his staff and, and his, his ideology agenda and his agenda. Some of the things that he shared with us made complete sense to me. Yeah. And some of the things didn't. And I think that's where, even in this situation with New Zealand and a lot of time in conservation and what's, I think is fascinating about Jared, you and 2% is like BHA land, Tawny, like they're focused on public lands and waters and wildlife and all that. And army F on the elk and public lands. Mm-hmm. And each one kind of has its specific species or specific task. You said it earlier in my office, like 2% represents all of them. He's kind of the, 2% is, is an organization which I, I kind of want to turn it over to you and let you kind of help people understand what it is that your organization does because I think it's fascinating. Um, it's it's much deeper than just, oh, these companies give 2% you know, of their time and their money. And so we certify them. Like it's it's much deeper than that. But I just kind of want to turn it over to you and allow okay. you to kind of tell people a little well, bit about what that is. So, I mean, uh, the basics are a business like yours gives 1% of your time which we do that as 21 hours of a, a worker's year. And we don't do that per employee. We do it just across the company 21 hours. If we did it per employee, some companies could do that. Some companies would need to hire someone and pay them 50 grand a year just to keep track of those hours. And at that point, that's 50 grand not going to conservation. So 21 hours a year per company, that's 1% of one person's time. And then 1% of annual gross sales that come in. Um, and though that sales going to conservation, those dollars going to conservation could be direct cash, could be donation of product, donation of services, basically anything a conservation org project uh, or or need would, would have to pay for. Um, if it's donated, we count that. Uh, for, for many orgs, being able to have a contractor come and donate the use of their team and equipment for an afternoon just saved them several grand. 
you know, so a couple hours of, of a contractor's time for a fence pull or something like that, or stream cleanup, that's, that's extremely valuable. Or in like with you doing the donation of product for banquets is huge because those are raffle dollars for you. It may not seem like a thing uh, of as great a scale as writing, you know, a big check the way it kind of used to be done. Uh, but donating product is absolutely essential. So we count those things, uh, hosting pint nights for a lot of breweries, BHA grew because of pint nights. I mean, you look at their event calendar, it's like pint nights, um, ducks unlimited. You look at theirs, it's banquets. Uh, and so donation of services, space, things like that, absolutely essential for keeping people together. So that's our, our main mission is, is to connect the businesses with the brands, because frankly, if, if license dollars were enough and tag dollars and dollars from firearm sales, ammunition, archery, fishing equipment, if it were enough, we wouldn't have all these orgs. You're right. We wouldn't need them. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe uh, National Wildlife Federation was founded the day after, or not the day, sorry, the year after the Pittman-Robertson Act went in, which puts an excise tax on firearm Sales and and yes yeah. and and whatnot. Hunting gear. Uh, and- Du Ducks Unlimited was right after as well. Yeah, the, I, I mean it was right away. The need was obvious back then, almost a hundred years ago, and that's just here in the U.S. Uh, overseas, things get even crazier. It, you absolutely have to have private business involvement for funding because those countries can't pay their way. We're talking about species that can't pay their way. They're full of those. Yeah, the U.S. still has plenty of those. And, and we put more money towards conservation than almost any other country. Some would say than any other country, but it's complicated. Um, so it's hard for them on the species level, but then on the national level to be able to do these things. So getting businesses involved where businesses care. So the things that Mountain Ops cares about, obviously we think elk are superior to many things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. My tag is not punch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, everything I'm hearing folks talk about or folks are talking about, you know, going and fishing. We're, we're sitting there packing bags and stuff with the conquer hunger and, and, and guys are talking about their fishing spots and whispering them, you know, there are things that the company cares about. So you're giving to those things and we yeah. encourage companies to do that. Uh, on the individual side, it's an honor system. We don't have uh, uh, an actual you know, application review because then I would have to be an attorney <laughs> and an accountant, and I have no desire to be either um, at all or see people's <laughs> private tax returns. So that's on honor system, and if you lie about it when you fill out the application, it's like the worst hunting karma in the world. You'll get limes like me, Giardia, and all the other things. <laughs> and you'll never fill your And tax. you'll never fill your yeah, tax. Tag soup for life. Tag soup yeah. for life. Um, so we have that side as well. And from the individual side, it's the volunteer hours mm-hmm. and getting them engaged with the different conservation groups that uh, do things that they care about. We don't take dollars and disperse them. We certify that people are doing it and that the businesses are doing it. Well, and that helps uh, the consumer right. support the companies that are, are exactly exercising conservation, who are engaged in conservation. Yeah, And um, I think that's powerful. You know, you, you look at purchasing some product from, from a certain organization, but before you do that, you find out whether they're, especially when you're looking at two equivalent companies, right. That are producing two equivalent products and, and you're like, Hmm, which one do I support? Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of what I'm based on. Like gritty Bowman, gritty podcast. What I do is I pretty much, I partner with those companies that, that, support conservation Mm -hmm. if they're not into conservation and if they're not uniquely american like i'm extremely (laughs) patriotic he's got some pillars of like these are these are yeses and nos and And those are two big ones if if you're european or foreign um i'm probably not going to 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 go out of my way to work for you unless you have (laughs) hardcore american values and you fly the flag (laughs) so um, some Swedish guy with an American flag <laughs> totally. tattooed on his we back. We might be able to work things out. But uh, but uh, I feel like that's critical to the future of our country is to whatever platform and whatever whatever voice that I have mm-hmm. that, that I engage and partner with and growing those companies that share the same values and desires mm-hmm. that I do. If they're engaged in conservation, if, they're in, if they protect the, the First and Second Amendments, those are things that are critical to me, mm-hmm. and I want to know which companies have the balls to do it, 
and yeah. are engaged and the ones that don't. Because the ones that don't, maybe I pr- appreciate the product you produce, mm-hmm. but I but if you don't stand for those things, I don't really need you. I don't really want you yeah. to grow in your power and your influence if you're not going to because use it's that not going to be healthy for our country. Yeah, it's. Uh, I look at this has been such a a great. I've learned a lot this year that I was not. Um, I would say I was pretty naive, or I just kind of was like the average guy that's like, oh, I'm a conservationist, you know, and I, I buy my tag every year, and so because of that, like you guys said earlier, like even even fiscally, it's not enough. We have to have yeah. organizations to help. We have to have these taxes on guns and ammunition and and weapons and different things like that that help fund these these essential needs that we have to protect the things that we love. And, you know, at Mountain Ops, one of the things that we have, just like Brian describes with Gritty, I mean, Operation Conservation, when I called you that, you know, and I said, hey, we're going to be doing this Operation Conservation. This is something we, we've always been doing, but we want to be a little bit more uh, adamant about it. We want to be a little vocal. bit more vocal. Uh, we want customers make to know that we, we want our this customers is what to you know. care about. Yeah, we want to know yeah. who we're working with. And so we kind of, we, we compiled... Um, uh, the operation conservation built it out. And, you know, what we said is in our core values and beliefs and Brian speaks to his own that he has, you know, in ours one that I, I, it was funny. Cause I was like, I read over our core values and belief and I looked at Trevor and I was like, we're missing one. And he's like, what is that? And I said, we're missing conservation. We've got integrity. We've got trust. We've got mm-hmm. character. We've got God. We've got all these things that are things that we truly believe as founders of this company. And as everybody who's a part of it, but I was like, we're, we're there's an there's an amendment. We need to insert this one, which is conservation, mm-hmm. because we, uh, we it's something that we are extremely passionate about, and, and we believe in the preservation of public lands, waters, and wildlife. And so, as we have spent, um, it's interesting because uh, for a company to somewhat pivot from uh, a campaign and just simply talking about your products and trying to help educate people on your products and, and right. your culture, your company, your brand. You know, we said we're going to dedicate 30 days to just talking about conservation and talking about Operation Conservation. And uh, we've been very happy with, the, um, to Brian's point, to see the people who have seen it and and now are like, you know, I knew you guys did it. I didn't know you did it on this kind of scale. Yeah. Or I didn't know you were working with these people. And even mm-hmm. people saying, mm-hmm. I didn't know who 2% was. So they're they're seeking out. And it's allowing yeah. us to to maybe... Uh, bring light to great organizations that we work with that we trust who to Brian's point shares the same values and yeah, beliefs that we do. Absolutely. And uh we're we want to be more active. We want to be more uh uh reactive or yeah. I would say less reactive less reactive and proactive. more proactive about uh the issues. And that can be Brian even told me he's like that's some as a company, that's some bold moves because you could you could potentially divide your customer base. Yeah. There may not be some that share the, the the land transfer issues that Jordan Harbertson feels passionate about. That as a founder of this company is going and defending and meeting with and trying to help you know fight for because they're saying no, I'm I'm on the side of having less smaller government or having a smaller government giving us. But at the end of the day, I think what I've learned is like we ought, we if we don't stand for something, mm-hmm. then we stand to lose everything. Yeah, simply as as yeah, we put it. we talked about that. I, we, I spoke to Leopold about this. We have a a um, you know they 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 stick their neck out for conservation. They're they're bold about it. They they stand yeah. for the the Second Amendment. Um, they get involved and in some issues that can be polarizing and can divide your customer base. And I see a lot of companies that take the other road where they play both sides. And they're like, yeah, we're not, we don't do anything political. We don't take a stance on any of these issues because, um, we're about business and yeah. not politics. Yeah. And to me, it's, it's, it's the two what's, are, the two are intertwined because you have to stand for what you believe in. You eventually yeah. evade the discussion and you play it safe and you just run your business. But then because you played it safe, you lose all of what your business is about. Mm -hmm. Right. Our business is about improving lives. Our business is about the outdoors. It's about these wild places and these wild things. It's about access for our customers to be able to go out and enjoy the places that our products are built to help you enjoy. And so if we turn a blind eye and we just say, uh, we're we're just going to, you know, we're just going to business as usual Mm -hmm. and we're not going to get involved in this stuff because it could, we could lose customers over it. I would, I I think between Trevor Casey and I, as we've had these discussions, because I sat down with him and I said, 
I think it is imperative that we as an organization or as a company help these organizations to be a voice for them as well as for ourselves to be able to to defend the things that we believe and that we care about. And while that, I said, here's, here's the problems with that. I said, mm-hmm. we could lose customers. We could have people. And Casey, Trevor, and I looked at each other and said, I would rather have a tribe of a thousand people that share our beliefs, that are passionate, mm-hmm. that will fight tooth and nail, like the 300 Spartans mm-hmm. that, w- that went up against hundreds of thousands of Persians mm-hmm. than to, um, to have these hundreds of thousands of wishwashy people that don't really share our beliefs, but maybe they like our product. Maybe they care. Maybe they're like, oh, I like this about you, but I don't like this. I want somebody that likes the whole of it. Yeah. And that's a bold stance to take, but um, I, I, I've also enjoyed watching Brian, and I've also enjoyed watching you, Jared. Um, I think it's really cool as I've begun to become more involved with the organizations and seeing the people who are behind these organizations. Just listen to everybody as you guys are listening to this podcast. Like, Listen to Jared's voice and how passionate and versed he is in conservation. conservation. Yeah, around the world. He's not just some guy that's like, oh, cool, this is an opportunity for me to like run an organization. Like, Jared cares. <laughs> there's so much money in it. <laughs> oh, there's so much. I mean, he's telling me how he's eating Top Ramen. He's like, hey. <laughs> no, it's – was an he's elk like, recipe. He's like, you're taking me out to dinner Can tonight? I get some oh my gosh. whey protein? <laughs> yeah. He's like, can I get just, that meal replacement, just, please? Just, just for a snack. <laughs> but the, I think the that we have got to uh, enlist in the ranks um, the 99% that yeah. is – feels that they're doing good. And, and I applaud everything they're doing, but I think that we can do more. Yeah. Is, and I think that's a lot of the yeah. discussion that I'm hearing well, from you two. And your, your, your tribe is bigger than you think it is. You know, uh, as far as it pertains to your core beliefs, we, we live in echo chambers on social media where it can sometimes pigeonhole who you think your followers are and who you think you have to be. Uh, you all made, I believe, the exact right choice in standing for what your company values are. We, there's plenty of examples of this in the outdoor industry, not just on the hunting side. Certain companies are known for their stances and they attract buyers just because of that. Now, uh, in the in the pursuit of not wanting to have short-term losses, folks will uh, companies will eventually lose their people. You know, in in the wishy-washy not taking a stance on something. And, and big corporations are particularly scared of this. We know companies that, you know, are not allowed to say certain things that they really want to say. Um, but there, there's a Martin Luther King quote of, uh, there comes a point where silence is betrayal. So you're worried about betraying a portion of your, your customer base by taking a strong stance in something right now. Down the line, If you didn't defend that thing, you may lose that thing Mm -hmm. and you've lost what you're, what is precious to your customers and precious to you. Um, and, and we have in the industry and when I say in the industry, I mean, hunting, fishing, non-consumptive as well. Many companies making billion uh, 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 together, something like $800 billion a year, but we're funding like so little to take care of it. There is a, especially in, in hunting and fishing, it's so disproportionate because we actually take a, a physical object out of the woods. Now I, I don't like the term non-consumptive for backpacking and climbing because you do consume, you drive to the trailhead, you beat up the trails, you, you know, it, there is damage done. Um, but we have companies making a lot of money on a, on a resource and not giving back to that resource. Most industries don't do that. That's not a, that you're not, uh, it's a, it's a bad hedging of bets Mm -hmm. and it's a bad look at your long-term investment for your company. And, and it's, it boggles my mind that, you know, we, we, we see a lot of folks say conservation is a dirty word now. You know, it's, it's a word that's been overused. Yes, it has by companies who actually aren't doing anything or doing very, very little. Um, I made a point to stick 2%'s neck out whenever I would see a company say, we love conservation, such and such on Instagram. We 2% messages them right away. I make a phone call. Let's get some paperwork. You know, let's, let's, let's put your mouth where your money supposedly is. Mm-hmm. They hang up. There, we have a culture shift that we need to make. Yeah. And, 
what we were discussing earlier today, you know, with, with your doing operation conservation, it's not just a, a sales platform for mountain ops. There'll always be some, some jack wagon who wants to, you know, say you're doing this good thing, but I think that sucks because of this. Um, or you're not, you're not you're being altruistic. Just yeah. You want money. Yeah. 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 They don't understand how valuable it is to the orgs. You have customers who probably did not know that there was a Pheasants Forever chapter in their area, but you made them think about it. They didn't know who BHA was, or maybe they had heard Green Decoy uh, garbage, which is a DC lobbyist thing that I don't want to hijack this podcast with, but um, they, they don't know, and you have now open their eyes to something new in an area that they care about that they can be giving back. You're, you're leading by example. And we need a lot more of that because the example so far is the reason why we have the personification of hunters in, in, in the general community that we do. 80 some percent of people approve of, of hunting, but you know, a very small percentage of folks in the U S actually hunt and it's even smaller overseas. Yeah. So, knowledge about the tool if you have a platform and aren't using it and aren't really using it it's gonna bite you in the butt in the long term and your customers as well yeah and it's it's uh it's to i think brian he always he always i love brian for many reasons uh but one thing i've always loved and learned about brian is that um he'll always address the most uncomfortable issues and the most, and, and, any, and it's almost like anytime somebody says, Oh dude, I wouldn't talk about that. It's almost like that's a bell to, Oh, Brian. let's please. Brian's like, <laughs> well, guess what? Where's my mic? Because I want to talk about this because that's the thing is so many people will hide from the most uncomfortable things. Or I think something you just brought up that Brian, I want to get your uh, take on it too, is like people that say like, uh, you know, we love conservation or we're, we're, we're conservationists and stuff like that. It's, but yet, and I'm not saying every business is able to get certified as a 1%, you know, money and 1% time. You yeah. know, you described earlier to me that there's businesses that you can't tell me who they are, but you are, they're doing a, almost a forensic on financials. And diving to try to in, help to them to try, keep track of how much they've given because they they've don't given even so know much. they've given so much yeah. and they didn't think that they were even a 1%. And for everyone listening on this podcast, I don't think you guys even understand how much that is just simply 1%. And Mountain Ops is doing more than that, mm -hmm. but we're proud that we're doing enough, but we're, we're not content and we want to do more. Yeah, we're a baseline standard. That's that you guys are setting a baseline standard. But yeah. Brian, I'm just curious because what when you what's your opinion on even what I said about earlier? Do you think or feel that um, you know a person does just simply say like, "Hey, I, I shot this animal. I'm a conservationist. I'm managing the land. I'm managing the herd," um, or I bought my tag at Walmart, or I bought my tag here for my state. Um, while while I agree mm -hmm. that those are dollars that are going back to those organizations or helping with conservation and hunting is conservation as the Rocky Mountain Foundation says. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that's enough? Do you feel indifferent? Do you feel what, what is your take on it? I feel like, um, so when Theodore Roosevelt, <clears throat> when he was deeply involved in the conservation movement and you have John Muir and you have Gifford Pinchot and you have all of these conservationists, um, you know, at this time, critical time in the United States, if, if, if Theodore Roosevelt isn't president of the United States, it's, 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 you have to look at it and, and really, really consider the fact that what we have today would not be here. I mean, mm -hmm. th what he did was that critical and, and, and important. And he did not do it. Uh, it was never easy. Conservation was never easy. It was it not was immediately people, popular either. No. He, he, there were people fighting him every bit of the way, calling him greeny, calling him, you know, um, a tree hugger, you know, the sort of terms that we use today to... To describe granolas. They yeah. were used first on him. <laughs> yeah. And, and you look at that, it wasn't money necessarily that made the difference, that made things happen. It it was influence and his action in action. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about money all we want, 
and the dollars that you spend on a tag uh, and how those dollars get rerouted or any money you donate to an organization, which I think is awesome. At the end of the day, I think what's most valuable is is an individual's intellect, their heart and soul, their drive, their desire to make a difference. That, to me, is far more important and adds more value to the future and and has the engagement it's it's king it trumps all all the rest so i feel like a lot of times we like to take that easy route and just write a check of some sort but yeah. i feel like if you really want to give back if you really want to make a difference if you want these lands here for your kids in the future if you want these animals here if you want to save species of 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 animals and and do conservation, then you've got to put your, you've got to actually put the best of you into it. Your, your, your heart, your soul, you have to use your influence. And, and that's where I love 2% is because I know there's, there are other organizations we talked about that is the, just the 1%, right? For the earth. Yeah. One, 1% 1 for the planet, which we are modeled after because modeled it's after. a simple model. But I think yeah. to Brian's point that he just addressed is, so there's the 1% of your money, monetary, yeah. and then 1% of your time. Yeah. And I think from what Brian's saying is like, we need this. You know, we can't just say, hey, we don't need any money because money makes the world go <laughs> No more money. And, and, and allows Jared to All the to orcs not. are going, whoa, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then Jared can't even have ramen noodles. My ramen so like, yeah, anymore. You I'm can't stuck do with that just elk. Yeah. But I think I love what you're saying, Brian, which is how I'm, I've been feeling over the last few months as I've been getting more involved. I've been listening to your podcasts. I've, I've even, I'm wanting to read more books about history and understanding things in its fullest and then understand the issues that we're fighting today is that time. I think that, you know, because when action and, and purpose and all these things come into play is because of the time that you mm -hmm. give them, the time you put into them. So where the money helps in funding the opportunities, the organizations, the companies and all that, that's important because we need that. The other layer that I love that 2% brings as an authentication of the company organizations that they work with and certify is that those companies and organizations are also giving time, action, yeah. and not just checks, but actual time yeah. To, yeah. to your point. Yeah. And we're, we're looking at right now, um, you know, th this year over uh, with our individual membership, uh, which is, you know, we're still a pretty young org. We're younger yeah. than Mountain Ops. Yeah, you guys yeah. started. <laughs> ready. I think you guys started two years ago. Right? Uh, three, and I was three. hired on a year ago this month. Yeah, that's right. Um, but we're, you know, we have we have two continents where we don't have certified members right now. Only two. Well, three Antarctica, but um, people still live there. <laughs> they do. They do. Uh, but it, you combine the volunteer hours amongst our individual. It, you multiply it. And you're looking at over 100,000 hours donated to conservation work. And it's not just 100,000 that is, is just out there in the ether. It's $100,000 in the local community that those people live in. Yeah, We've got folks all over the U.S. Uh, I got this nasty gram on Instagram from a, a, just an obnoxious social media account that just loves to pick at people. And uh, they chose it, – it was our turn. And they were like, oh, you're just a bunch of Westies. Like, all right, I'm putting my member map up on the website because folks are getting this around the world. Mm -hmm. They're understanding the need for this, the, this, this element of personal engagement. The term conservationist is not a participation trophy for buying a tag. Yeah. It, it makes you as much a conservationist mm -hmm. as... Me paying taxes on my house makes me an elementary school teacher because some of those dollars go to the local school. Right. <laughs> that's the fact of it. Yeah. And 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 the unfortunately there have been elements within our community who have tried to say, yes, buy a gun and it makes you a conservationist. There's other ways to protect the Second Amendment. Don't bastardize conservation and yeah. fish and wildlife and our future uh, and the lands that we use. For, for, for that. And so we, we have a, a bit of a, a cultural shift that we need to help. Happen. Well, and I think the culture shift is if you look at uh, just the other day, we were watching some hunting TV, uh, the old school kind of stuff. It was, um, 
Yeah, the old old lodge. films. Oh, Casey's telling me about <laughs> yeah, that. You're yeah. plugging in DVDs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm watching some stuff and I'm just like, this stuff is so – It's it's it does not – if this is what we have to represent hunting and what hunters stand for, we're yeah. doomed. We're yeah. doomed. It, it it's it's kind of like what's the Adventures of a Whitetail Hunter or whatever that came <laughs> oh, out. Oh, the that Netflix TV film. So many people were so mad and I was like, no – this, this is important yeah. for people in the industry to it, watch. It just doesn't slap you in the face and, and we give did. you perspective on how people actually Pers- are looking at us and perceive us. Uh, take a take a look and, in the mirror and look at it. You have like the Randy Newberg or, or the uh, the the Meat Eater TV Stephen Ranella kind of program, right? Right. Where conservation or cooking in meat and the connection to your food, all of that stuff is all, all well presented. It's intellectual. It's educational. And that's what I want people to think of when they think of hunting. Yeah. And then you have this oh, culture of, you know, can't stop the flop and, you yeah. know, and, and whack them and stack them. Yeah. And, and oh. I, and it's a, uh, for me, I feel like that really undermines what we mm-hmm. what we are and what we're about. It's, it doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent the things I value. Yeah. And I think that culture is dying. Yeah. It's dying. And you know, we're not, but not slowly. No, no. Not slowly. Not, <laughs> not, slowly. not gracefully. They are not going quietly not into gracefully. the night. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, people, people listen to this podcast, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'll get roasted for saying this, but Eric Chess and I were talking about this on our hunt. Um, we just got back from Idaho. And uh, Eric shot a very mature bull, mm. public land, mm. over the counter. Great opportunity. Um, let's just say that luck came knocking and he answered it. I yeah. mean, we were stalking another bull and this other more mature bull showed up and he what took a great a shot at 75. Yeah, yeah, 70 yards is what he shot him at. And we talked about it. We, it was funny as we were breaking the bull down. We were having this discussion. Mm. And we were talking about it because everyone was, uh, everyone was messaging him saying, congratulations. You know, the first two questions that were asked was how far mm. and how big is he, right? Like what's mm-hmm. his, what does he score? And Eric just called me yesterday and told me the score of this bowl. Um, so it's been almost uh, a week. And as we were having the discussion, we were talking about it saying, isn't it interesting? I said to him, and we were talking about the th- the theory of thirsty for likes. Like, you know how people get so yeah. thirsty for likes on social media. I want to I want to post my trophy picture and I want to get a million likes. And and you know obviously his bowl got a lot of engagement, a lot of likes, and a lot of people interested in in what just happened because they had been following his story of him hunting in that area for like three weeks. Mm-hmm. So to have it end cap that way was pretty remarkable. Yeah. But what I told him and what he also believed too is he said, Jordan, I also feel like if I had shot a lesser mature bowl that the result almost might have been extremely similar in the amount of engagements, comments, people reaching out and saying, and because the culture shifting to where people are great, happy to see people succeed with um, not the monster bulls and the monster mm-hmm. bucks. And mind you, his, his animal did score 385 inches, a mm-hmm. very sought after public land, like just doesn't happen <laughs> every giant. day. Giant. Yeah. And, but had he shot a 300, I said, that's what hush has done is they go out and they hunt and they enjoy. And when they have that opportunity, the celebrating of the experience of the experience is is, is beyond is more the size of the the size, you know, like Corey Jacobson, whenever, when I first met him, I remember he talked about, he's like in my magazine, um, we don't show, we don't talk about score. No, El- and and a lot of the stories were with four by four bulls. Yeah, just these. You know, I mean, just this kind of average bull. And I How know do there's you sell a magazine with a four by four. <laughs> and I know, <laughs> right? And I know to your guys's point, uh, I think there's a lot. Like you say, it's slowly shifting, and some of these guys are just not yeah. going to let it go. But in truth, like I'm seeing that shift where because of social media. People's ability to share their experience is just they don't have they don't need a TV show or a magazine to do it anymore. Right. They can share it today, tomorrow, whenever they want, any time of the day, morning, mm-hmm. evening, and night. Yeah. And they're sharing that they got a doe, and their yeah. friends are pumped for them. They're sharing that they got you know a little buck. They, they're, yep. they're pumped for them. And that culture is changing to saying, I am so grateful for the experience that I had, the meat that I am now providing for myself, my family, or my friends. And it is becoming more about the experience, more about the animal. And some of the stuff that like, I feel like Steve Rennell is doing that you described with his show, and it's less about the mass and trash and inches and what did he score. And 
Eric was like, dude, I was all about that world. This is the world I lived in. Mm-hmm. The size of animal, the, you know, what, what did he score? What's his gross? What's his net? All these things. He's like, I am so over here now. And yeah. he's, I'm watching everybody go that way too. So I, I guess I might get roasted and for I that. Think, but I, well, and, and I think that's part of the, the counterculture that's going on here is us focusing more on what you're talking about, which Brian is like the experience, mm-hmm. the education, um, where that meat comes from, where it ends up and less about, oh my gosh, look at this. In my first BHA event I went to, the first rendezvous that I went to, Steve Ronella was the, was the keynote speaker. And oh. he stood up and, and he, he was, as he always does, he gave a great little uh, story and, and, and shared his thoughts before we pumped everybody for dollars at the banquet. <laughs> and, uh, and as he was there, he said, you know, as he was growing up, he just kind of took for granted public lands. I mean, he didn't even know the concept of it. He just knew that they could ride their bikes, you know, mm-hmm. uh, over into these hills and then they could explore it and take their BB guns and stuff with them and they could go and do whatever they wanted and then go yeah. home. And, and he spent a lot of his youth taking and taking and taking trapping, hunting, fishing, all of it. And, and pulling from the outdoors and taking from the outdoors. And then all of a sudden, you know, he got older and older and, and his, his priorities changed and he matured a little bit. And he was like, he felt all of a sudden, a deep gratitude for it and, and a need to give back, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, that's the evolution of a hunter in many ways. It's, it's the same with, with, uh, how you hunt. A lot of the, the motives and the drives and the, and the reasons you hunt maybe are change. They evolve as you change and mature as a person, hopefully. Yeah. And, and I feel like conservation, like I've seen it much in Jordan and Casey both, uh, over the years. That where they started on the subject years ago to where they are now, it's a, it's a maturity, mm-hmm. and they see the the wisdom and and the importance of it, and so they're they're more engaged in it than they than they ever were in the past, and and beginning to really make up a, a mark in in a positive way yeah. for things that they truly believe in. When you tell me, Jared, that there are people out there, industries out there that are not Engaged in conservation and when, businesses, yeah, businesses. Yeah. And when you, when these businesses are taking from this community, mm-hmm. like profiting from it and, mm-hmm. and doing what they do, but n- they have not made it a priority to oh, give it's not back even a conversation or a conversation. Yeah. I think that, like I said before, that, that that's sort of that cultural difference between what's the mature you know, yeah. how people, how individuals are changing. I think organizations mature as well. Yeah. And either they, they care about those things and they want to give back or they're takers. Yeah. And I, what I like about 2% for conservation is that it's that accountability company that can say, okay, you know, let's have some accountability for all this stuff we, we, we say we do. Yeah. And you can actually have it independently certified to say, yeah. They actually do what they say they do. Yeah. It's, this isn't them like, you know, faking it. Yeah. And I like that because then you have the opportunity as a consumer. And I think consumers have the ultimate power. Yeah. To, to, oh, they definitely hold companies do. accountable. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, 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 uh, when, when you're looking at, at trying to do a, a deep cultural shift in something that is so broad as hunting, I mean, we we're talking about, Tar in New Zealand. Tar aren't from New Zealand, <laughs> you know. And here we are sitting in Utah, and I just flew down from Montana this morning, and mm-hmm. you know I've got seventeen tags in my pocket, <laughs> and not in Utah, but I know what's why, going on down here because that's he, why yeah. he eats top ramen. He put all his <laughs> there's money. all the meat in there <laughs> yeah. and all those tags and and uh, in my soup. Uh, <laughs> but it, you you have such a broad uh, range of people, mm-hmm. and with that you have broad range of media and, and that's social media. That's, that's TV media. That's print media. Um, it's why we started a conservation media award last year. Uh, Jason Matzinger won it for project elk. Uh, but we had applications in for stuff with tarpon stuff with quail Mm. stuff with pheasant and ducks. There there were several involving, uh, duck issues. 
Uh, yeah. You can you can go way down the waterfowl rabbit hole, mm-hmm. and you can go down the rabbit rabbit hole. <laughs> hunting is extremely involved, and the conservation that is done via hunting is extremely involved. So the media, it it needs to to your point mature, and. Uh, uh, many folks, if they're in an echo chamber, if they're only watching the same shows they've always watched, listening to the same podcasts they've always listened to, reading the same magazines, following the same people on social media, you will not mature. I make a point to try to follow someone new, and I and my my personal social media is like locked down. It is friends and like yeah. unless we've sat down like this and had a conversation. Probably not going to be friends, <laughs> uh, you know. uh, and that's that's just my personal choice. But uh, you know, try to follow and see e- even outside of the hunting community, these folks who have a platform, like with the grizzly stuff going on right now. I was following a lot of these folks who have a platform because I want to get in their head. I want to yeah. know why why they are 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 risking life and limb, in some cases literally, to try to keep folks from using hunting as a tool. Right. So unless we're willing to broaden our scope, yep. you won't mature. Yep. And I, I teach hunters ed, um, huge plug here for folks who hunt at all. There is a huge shortage of hunters ed instructors across the country. Easy way to give back your time. You hit those 21 hours teaching once a year. Uh, but I teach hunters ed and sometimes I get to teach the adult class and I've noticed a trend. We're having many more women join. And so I started asking, they, these are, these are women in their twenties, thirties, forties, um, to the point they're making up almost half of my classroom and I ask them, you know, what's, what, what's bringing you into hunting? I ask all the, all the adults and I hate the term adult onset hunter. Um, but the, I think y'all said it sounded like a disease. <laughs> I heard someone say that. I think it was, I, <laughs> I use it all the time. It's like, it's like, and, and so when I say it, they all look like, I'm a what? Anyway, I ask them, you know, what, what got you into it? And they mention, they mention podcasts. They mention TV shows. And I say, okay, which TV shows? And they're like, the ones on Netflix or Amazon. And yeah. so I know exactly who it is yeah. at that point. And it's the educational stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I want to get my own meat. I was like, okay, so you, you watch it with your boyfriend, your husband, and then they get really offended because I was just inadvertently sexist. They're coming of their own volition <laughs> yeah. to learn how to hunt. It's bringing in new hunters, and these new hunters, they're interested more in Eric's story of his hunt yep. than they are in a big <clears throat> sexy buck that we went. <laughs> yeah. And you can see the fence that's 40 feet tall, and there's high fence and there's high fence. But you know, <laughs> they, can't, they can't relate to that. Most no. of them can't afford to do that. They can't afford, you know, they can't afford what has traditionally sold media. Mm-hmm. They can't afford the $20,000 worth of gear to 20 get. 20 bucks in 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> they just can't afford and whack that. Whack them and stack them. It's not, it, they can't connect with it. You're Kill right. it and grill it. And yeah. so to get them interested in conservation, hell no. Yeah. Because they can't relate. With the thing that these folks are supposedly passionate about. If you look at hours of time spent towards advertising, you find out what they're really passionate about. Eating, just like me. But <laughs> when you look at, at the educational ones and where they spend their time and what they talk about, it's things that these folks already are in some way passionate about, probably. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah. that will bring in new blood. That will bring in folks who are interested in giving back and people who... You know, at least have 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 the uh, foresight to go and look at something that's outside their personal comfort zone. I think you bring up something interesting real quick. Is just uh, you talk about like the media in which this is being consumed mm. that's bringing in these new people that you're finding at hunter education. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just don't think that a lot of these people, if we went and did a survey on them, or watching uh, Outdoor Channel or Sportsman's Channel. And finding that on their, I I think that they are consuming media. I, I would I would. They might be watching a few shows. They they but they, not not the bulk of the programming. Not the bulk of the programming to see yeah. to to Brian's point, the education that they're getting by listening to podcasts. They got introduced yeah. by a friend. You know whether they they or found YouTube. Joe Rogan something that's very accessible. Something that's extremely space. accessible. Or or they came if you across. Have to go ex- out and buy an app. And then download it and pay a monthly fee to access like the outdoor channel. Or if you're a cable or you have cutter, to buy a cable yeah. and all that, yeah. and, and then actually subscribe and then you have to subscribe for, for that specific package. channel. That's what I it's mean. It's like is. you're basically preaching to a choir. 
you're not to you know you're in an echo chamber with your with your content yeah. you're not reaching no. the broad com- community mm-hmm. because i can tell you i am not going to watch gymnastics or ballerina uh, until, if I have to go and subscribe to the program. Yeah, until now, the if it pops so you'll up, hop on YouTube but and be happy with But if it pops up that. free on <laughs> YouTube and my daughter's like, check this out. Top 10 or, best gymnastic then I'll watch it. of all time. But, but, and, then, and then I'll be exposed to it. And then I might actually value right. the ballerina spinny stuff. Possibly. Possibly. But I can guarantee you I ain't going to go on pay the program to go find and, out about pay it. and find out no. about it. So w- one of the gals uh, – mentioned i said okay how did you end up watching meat eater on netflix were, were you, you know, right searching exactly. yeah and she said it came up as a recommended after watching a cooking show exactly and she she was just curious well Jimmy. last year she shot her first dough and she ate the whole thing yeah you know and went on her own no dudes involved she didn't buy any camel either because she couldn't afford it she's got mm-hmm. three jobs typical millennial overworking being everyone assuming she's not working yeah and <laughs> She went out, got a public land dough. Yeah. I know a lot of grown men who can't go get a public land dough, <laughs> yeah. you know, who are real hunters. Um, but then I have, so last night I have a kid's class this week. I'm actually missing class tonight, which is fine. Hunter's but, ed. Yeah. Yeah. Teaching hunter's ed this week. We, it's, a, it's a night where I don't have to be there. But I was teaching last night and a kid kept grabbing we were doing hand carries and he kept grabbing the gun and putting his his hand around around the the trigger guard Mm -hmm. now that may sound petty but that's a fail in our class because your hands on the trigger we yeah yeah. it's it's a no touch zone and these are these are 10 year old kids that we're going to let go out and we don't let them drive yet and we're Mm -hmm. scared to death when they're 16 and they do but we're going to give them a high power rifle and send them out on public land to hunt with us you know so and it. and I asked him you know, why why are you doing that? Because he, he had never he said this is my first time holding the gun, and he kept grabbing it like that. And he said, "Well, I see guys carry it like that all the time." I was like, "He said your dad doesn't hunt." He said, "No, on TV." <laughs> and and so I started asking, you know, what are some things you've seen on TV that you know contradict what we've talked about about ethics and all these different things? And they just these twelve year old kids, ten year old kids are listing off stuff they've seen in shows. And yeah. I, it just made my heart sink. You know, and that was last night. Well, and I, you know, I want to touch on, touch on that just briefly. Um, I have a lot of people that write in when I start talking about, like I do a, a podcast on conservation about Senator Mike Lee and, and this whole uh, public land mm-hmm. f- federal state issue. And so I have this discussion and I have a lot of people who write in who say they're just discouraged super discouraged because as they get involved in conservation and they speak out, how many people come back and say something about how they, they, they just get so much opposition to this. And it's who's opposing them. That is often the most discouraging. Yeah. And they're like, well, I thought they were also a hunter or, or, and then they realized, man, there's just such an uphill battle. Can we even win this thing? Mm. But then you have the people like you're describing that, you know, watch Netflix, a uh, little meat eater, and now they've got their Netflix own gun and, kill. and they're watching yeah. the dough. Yeah. And, and so I, I sit there and I have to say, you know, um, and I say this often, well, what else are you going to do? Are you just going to roll over and give up? You're going to circle the wagons and scream louder? Yeah. Because you look real dumb doing it. Yeah. You know, uh, it, yesterday was the announcement of the, you know, the grizzly uh, hunt ban uh, or, 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 uh, long-term postponement Mm -hmm. and i I was telling jordan earlier i I was having to put out some social media fires um from certain folks who have platforms misbehaving themselves yeah calling like let's let's go hunt this judge down yeah you know saying stupid stuff like that who have platforms where new hunters on the fence hunters and when we say hunters, we want to ultimately turn them into conservationists. Yeah. They're seeing that and going, whoa, I don't relate with that kind of extreme idea. Mm-hmm. It's um, kind of like when the antis attack us. Yeah. And they use the same kind of rhetoric of like, why? Well, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to come kill How about you. I kill you and yeah. your whole family. And your whole family. See, I've, I've and they had... go, they push it, the, <laughs> they, they go way beyond the line. So um, last, last year. Last year, um, so I, I, I volunteer on the Montana board of, of 
backcountry hunters and anglers. And uh, last year there was the monument stuff in Montana. And one section, uh, there were the Breaks monuments, uh, monument, which is like huge funder for sheep. The sheep that come out of there, the mm-hmm. Sheep Foundation will sell them for up to 400000 or more, and that money goes straight back into conservation. Same with the elk. People put in for that area, and the plans that we were hearing from folks who are in the industry that was looking at using that area after it was made not a monument, it just really put that kind of stuff in jeopardy. So my wife and I were in uh, some TV ads in Montana, which is not – I got a face for radio Dude. and a voice, a voice for, for, for Braille. <laughs> <laughs> but my but my my wife is is awesome and i got death threats on facebook because the i mean the the ad was like you know zinky's doing what to our public lands he needs to listen to sportsmen and yada yada let's have us be part of the process it wasn't like kill zink you know, it wasn't like that at all it wasn't disrespectful and he ended up dropping the brakes off of the off the list like the day after the ad aired the first time. Well, then it played for a whole month. So I had a whole month of Facebook threats. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, like uh, yeah. one guy sent me a, a Google street view of, we had moved like eight months prior G- Google street view of our old house. And he said, well, I can come over anytime and settle this. <laughs> you have to sleep at some point. Yeah. And I'm reading this message at two in the morning and I'm just like, you know, hearts pumping. Like, do I need to call the cops? What do I? Yeah. And and that was that was from someone who I have seen volunteer at different conservation events. So when we have that kind of stuff going on, it makes it real hard. If we if we can't mature to the point that you both made, if we can't mature and and look beyond our personal immediate interest or the things that we have known for a long time, and maybe go, huh. Maybe things are not everything that I think that they are. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should research some more. Maybe I should read some more. Audible is a wonderful thing. If you hate to read, most of them books are on there. Yeah. And yeah. you can listen. I'm a big, big uh, Audible book. Listener. I love Audible. My Audible library continues to grow with the books Brian gives me and the new <laughs> ones I'm finding. I think I've got like a dozen Eric, Audible books just on TR. Eric gets in my car. <laughs> he gets in my car and we're, we're driving to go to another spot to glass and I've got, uh, I'm rereading um, Ryan McDonald's uh, uh, Obstacles the Way. Oh, Ryan he, Holiday. Or Ryan Holiday, not McDonald. Oh, that's my neighbor. Ryan Holiday. Thank you. Uh, Obstacles the Way, which is an awesome book. And it's been a while since I've read it because uh, we did a podcast on it. Um, and I am sitting there and, and Eric goes, this isn't music. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, Eric, I go, I know. I'm sorry. I can turn on music if you can't handle this. But I said... Um, why don't you just just listen to what this book is, what it feels si- like. is saying? Oh. And it's our drive is like 40 minutes. We're going to get 40 minutes of this guy talking about these different subjects on this chapter. Mm-hmm. And so we're listening to this chapter. And uh, before we open the door, he goes, I should probably stop listening to music. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I said, listen, music it creates emotion. It's sensational. Yeah. It gives thought to things that happen during when that song happened or anything that's tied to it, which it can, sparks my creativity. It can spark and, creativity. Yeah, it yeah, can excite yeah. you. And so I think find the time for that. But I said, uh, listening to a book or listening to this stuff, I mean, it's, you could go to school with the amount of time that like you that. spend in your, in your car listening to music. No. And if you switched and listened to actual educational There's that and informational books. Quote, and I should figure out who actually started. I heard it from Dave Ramsey the first time, but uh, he's quoting someone else. I can't remember now, but um, it's a, it's it, the quote goes like this. It's, uh, you're the same today as you are 10, 20 years from now, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Um, that's a combination of two because Ben Franklin's the first half. Yeah. 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 So those books you read, uh, and, and I would say the, 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 the people you meet, but I would also say the, um, the places you go, you yeah. know, and the media Having traveled the world, the uh, media you take in. Yeah. But, uh, my, my grandparents, so my, my family, my mom's side, they were in South America starting in uh, like uh, my great grandpa brought the first uh, non-commercial airplane into Paraguay. Uh, they were they were missionaries for a uh, Christian outfit. Um, my gra- my great grandparents were my grandparents were. My mom grew up in Paraguay, um, and so my grandparents have crazy stories. My grandma can speak several 
languages fluently. Mm, yeah. And she learned them at a time when most girls in the world weren't allowed to learn how to read, you know. Um, but they, they like to say that travel will not only open your mind to see the areas where you're lacking information, but it, it diffuses prejudice. Oh, absolutely. It educates you on it how. It creates, if you're a U.S. citizen, it creates gratitude for what you have. Massive gratitude. Like, spend some time in India. Go to India and live there for a month. Go, go to. Get your shots, but yeah. Go, to, go to yeah. Africa, go to Asia, go to a few other places in the world, and then come back and tell me that America sucks. Yeah. Because you'll be singing a different tune. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Uh, I wish it was almost mandatory, you know, and, and Jordan and I are both LDS people know that a lot of young men in, in our, in our church, they go on a mission to another country, often to another country. Sometimes they stay in the U S but they often are in Brazil or some third world. They go somewhere hole. that's, that's not whatever. Yeah. They get culture and there's shocked. A, there is fast. a, there is yeah. a, wide, it's a head whipper and not, not kidding you. <laughs> I went to New York City. <laughs> I went oh, to my very, a lot. I drop they dropped me into the Bronx, Fordham Road, which is the main road. Oh yeah. And I am culture shocked immediately. Yeah. Because I'm living in Utah in near Salt Lake City, the <laughs> cleanest city on earth. Uh which I don't even consider a city after living in New York City. And uh yeah, you get rocked even right here in the United Your States. And then you got Brian who's who went and lived in Japan. And Hiroshima. Yeah. And Hiroshima. And lived in a completely different culture. Yeah. So different and stark than the United States. And my friend and Matt served in Chile. And uh, Casey <laughs> Casey served in Oregon. That's weird. You know, <laughs> Portland. I'm in Portland. Yeah. Right in my backyard. That's counterculture. My brother went to Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But you get sent to these places and you start to... I think what I always find, too, is people come back. And whether you're just a tourist, whether you're a traveler, mm -hmm. whether it's, you're, you're a missionary for your church and you're spreading your church's uh, word and gospel or whatever it is. Even going for work. Even if you're just going to, yeah. for work and you're, yeah. and you're expected to be like, you got to fly to China, right? Because you got to do meetings in China or you got to go to Russia. And you're not doing just the, the airplane to hotel to meeting room to hotel to you airplane. You got to live. You got you to do while. some stuff there. Because yeah. you got to spend... Yeah. Like maybe a month they're getting like negotiations or whatever and, the the position is. And Montezuma's revenge, diarrhea. Oh man, <laughs> things like that. That that'll help you, you really appreciate you your country. Start to appreciate your country. <laughs> Dysentery awesome. makes you just exactly. <laughs> exactly. When we discovered that the water we'd been drinking in the from the tank had had like fuzzy lizards in it. Yeah. <laughs> and I It'll think, and that was the nice water. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the thing that I feel like you know and kind of bringing this all together and kind of um as we kind of close down this podcast is you know each one of us at this table uh, i feel is extremely grateful for the land um that we have oh the um, country we live in this is this i love the saying this land is your land this land is my land you know mm -hmm. it's just a, from that song just super simple but it is it's it's all of our land the 25 percent that we have uh, to to That's access public. publicly, mm -hmm. we have a hundred percent of the United States that uh, if we get permission or we have the ability to, we can we can use. But we have twenty five percent that is left for our use um, as outdoorsmen, as anglers, as uh, enthusiasts, as whatever you want to define who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I just I, I love the passion that you two share. Um, and I've shared on this podcast and the, the information that you've provided today, Jared, for a lot of people to understand not only who 2% it is, but who you are, what you stand for, what you believe, which are the same beliefs that Brian and I share and beliefs in our, our companies and core values. And, uh, I just, uh, I just hope that everyone that's listening and has listened today learned something and maybe can take something more away than just knowledge, but to Brian's point some action items that yeah. they can do, um, get involved with 2%, uh, go to 2% or, uh, fish, fish and, and wildlife.org. Fish and wildlife. Because 2% for conservation is a long website. And everybody's going to misspell that. No yeah. one's going to, that yeah. domain. Fish doesn't. and wildlife.org. Dot com. Become dot org. Dot org. Yeah. yeah. Dot org. Not dot com. That's a fish guide service somewhere. And wildlife. And wildlife. Dot org. And yep. they can, they can get, they can Individuals get in can get certified like, Individual While they're listening to this, businesses, we have an application, but it's super simple to fill out. Now, if you've been donating like crazy, yeah, we're going to have to track that down. Mm -hmm. But most folks can fill out the business application that's, while I'm standing right in front of That's the thing I want to tell. Uh, as a business owner myself, 
I encourage any business owner of any magnitude. I don't care if you own industry. I don't care if you own a podcast. I don't care if you own a nutrition company. You own a gear company. You own a broadhead. You own it. I would encourage you to take a look at your company, and if you know that you're doing it, Mm. reach out to Jared and and two percent for conservation and get certified and be proud to put that on your packaging and to put that on your website and to be mm-hmm. able to share that with your customers and also if you're not doing it i would then invite you to maybe take a look at your business the way brian described it and say hey you know let's not just say that we do conservation because we're we exist in this this community but are we actually no. doing conservation and are we helping and perpetuating the message what are we doing to do yeah. that Guys, got to look at two percent for conservation. Look at what this organization's doing. Uh, you're doing some good things, man. Uh, and, and if folks have questions, we take them. You know, I just today via Instagram, email, a couple text messages. You know, I don't know who to give my time to, and and we can really help with that. Yeah. We don't tell you who you have to. Well, yeah. You know, we look at what what are you interested in because if you're interested in that, odds are you'll stick with it, and that'll really help the causes out. And it'll help you out too. It'll help as an individual or as a business, better quality of life. If you're doing stuff like this. Yeah. So absolutely. Well, let's wrap this up. Thank you folks for listening to the gritty podcast. Um, check out uh, fish and wildlife.org. Yeah. And as always stay gritty, stay gritty, everybody. <laughs> Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals and the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>